Hi everyone, I'm Matthew David and I'm running this podcast, Game of Alpha. I'm welcoming today uh, JX Pong. Uh, JX has been in, in China for uh, 25 years, I, if, if I calculate right, uh, since 1992. And you have been funding the company TBX in interior design um, with about, uh, what the number, like 250 thousand square meters delivered uh, over the last 12 years and TBX according to your website was funded in 1958 so you have to explain me something on that uh, because uh, you don't seem that old and uh, you said that you started China in 2005 so I'd like to, to, to run this interview and to understand better about how, what it is about um, starting a business in China, especially when you have you are you have been in China since 1992. I mean, 1992. Very few foreigners were in China at the time. Uh, three years back from 1992, a lot of foreigners left China. So I think a lot of stories about it. And also, I discovered that you had a lot to teach us. Um, you came to my office like I think a month ago. And I thought I knew what you were doing. I thought I knew what you did before, and I learned so much more. I thought I, I found out that you have several experiences, several lives in China, uh, which are very intense. And I got you on the phone recently for my own office because I needed advice. And I was amazed by your ability to find the right way of talking to me because you come with me. So welcome to the to the show. JX, and uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me here. Uh, actually, it was not right on the date. Um, let me put it in this way. First, the history of DBX. Um, the full history is my grand, it's, it's, it's run in my family. My granddad was in construction, my mom was in construction, and back in the day, they had a company uh, called Maison Moreau. Uh, and they were doing construction and architecture. Uh, my mom came to China in 92 for a project. Uh, and then she basically, she let me come to China in 94. Okay, so myself, I came to in 94. Uh, and basically, I was not interested in running any kind of architecture or any kind of construction business. So I, as you mentioned, it, I had many lives. Uh, I work in an entertainment business, managing the biggest club in Shanghai back in the days. It was a fantastic experience. I learned a lot. I think I've seen things that few foreigners have seen um, many few Chinese have seen, uh, and it was a great time. And then they moved into consulting, market entry consulting and management consulting, obviously that was my strong point. And then I became a chief representative for a French company that was also into market entry for French uh, small enterprise based in West of France. Um, and then in uh, 2002, yes, it was 2002, I was offered a position in uh, then the top three uh, design and build company in Shanghai. And honestly, I moved in uh, because he wanted a uh, deputy general manager and I was good in management, so I moved in. Um, and I got caught by, uh, by uh, I would say, my family uh, spirit. So in 2004, and after 2004, I created DBX. Uh, so what we did, basically, we told my mom, I said, listen, you know what, we're gonna buy your business back with my partner, or in the name, your name. Uh, and it turned out that we didn't even use our name. So we created this. But it was, it was, I would say it was important for the Chinese to understand that this company was not just created in 2004 or 2005. It was important to say, okay, you know, we are created in 58. Um, but then again, when you come to our new, next, new website now that we have 12 years history, I don't think you have any mention of it. Okay, okay. It's on your website. And I uh, was quite, quite surprised yeah. that uh, you have so historical rules, yeah. I, I, I went through a website, through LinkedIn, so that I could find, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's written 1958, which is, uh, which is surprising, and um, yeah, can, can, can help to begin the conversation. So, interesting, interesting point. So, what did you leverage from your mother in terms of uh, assets? I mean, uh, it, what, was it purely for branding to other Chinese, Chinese clients, or did you leverage something? So it was purely branding to our Chinese clients. Uh, we had no, uh, we didn't use any, any assets, uh, basically because it was not adapted to the Chinese market, that's it. Um, and we, we really started with my partner, my Chinese partner. Uh, that's it, two of us, like, uh, you know, uh, carrying our bags, running around, going to meetings. 
And luckily for me, I had a, a good network at the time of real estate agent. I had a good network of clients. Uh, so we started the company with our clients already. Um, many clients follow me. Um, and that's it, you know. And, uh, but it was when we met new clients, new Chinese clients, it was important for them to, to think that, okay, we didn't just pop up on the marketplace. Um, so it, it was in a way for, to reassure them. Okay. I usually begin with a question about the size of the company, metrics on the company. Um, what well, was a metric actually to be founded in 1958? But uh, do you have? To, can you share with us some metrics about the company, like turnover, number of people, uh, number of projects? I gave already some of them, like 250,000 square meters delivered, about 15 designers and 100 workers. If the numbers are still correct on your website, um, could you give us numbers or revenues? Okay, so basically the numbers are still correct. Uh, what we did is, um, you know, when I worked before in the previous company called CTL, when I was a deputy general manager, uh, this company was as a DNB, design and grid, it was huge. I mean, we had 200 full time workers, we had 70 staff. And when I created DBX with my, with my partner, we told ourselves, hey, listen, we, we would never be that big uh, because it was, not, it was just not uh, logical to be that big. You know, we have different way of managing people. We sh the most important thing was to ensure the client's quality and the design quality. So what we had, it, we had a tight team of, of designers. Uh, called them the, it was like, you know, a bit like special forces. Um, so each designer could, be, could do everything from concept to design, to construction drawing, to follow the, each, each, uh, site, each uh, project. Um, and we built on this kind of management. So we had a team of 15 employees, 15 unborn employees at the most. You know, we moved from, uh, sometimes, some years we have eight, 10, 15. Um, and then what we had, we had hundreds of workers, sometimes even more, working for us. So the beauty of it is because we were busy, because we had good business, and we still have, they were not, under her payroll, but they were only mainly doing a project. That's the thing. So that allowed us to, to uh, basically have more revenue in terms of, uh, of net profit, and uh, instead of my own uh, old company that was just like, that was crawling under like 200 employees, 100 workers under their payroll. So what we did in, uh, I believe it was in 2008, was maybe our best year, we did 6 million US dollar. When you look at it, for 15 staff, it's not that good. Uh, and I mean, we have driven this year, it was, it was great. It was like, a, it's, it's the way we manage our team was really in terms of risk control. So each designer had, had its own freedom of doing project. Of course, I was the one like, uh, leading the concept, uh, but he has his, his own freedom. He, he, had, he could do within a certain time frame, but he could basically go on site, uh, go, on, go on site or go and have a coffee with his friend. But at, as long as the job was done, was great. So the funny thing is, doing this kind of management, we have a huge, like a huge uh, staff retention. So staff stay with us most of them for nine years, which in China is a lot. Okay, I see, I see. So you were funding in 2004, and five years after, you reached uh, 6 million US um, revenue. It was less than four years after. I mean, it was like, it was great. Uh, basically, we, we almost doubled our or turnover each year it was great. 2005 we did great. 2006 was okay. was good. 2007 was 2007 was good. 2008 was a peak. Uh, we took a hit during the financial crisis, like everyone. Uh, but even though we only felt the hit in, in 2010, uh, and because we diversified, you know, we went into a light industrial project. DBX was mainly built to uh, created to. Uh, to answer the office demand, office design and build demand. And then what I did is I uh, spread uh, just like uh, uh, to light industrial. So it's is five, seven, 10,000 square meter project. Uh, and then of course I expanded into Africa. Okay, okay. we will go back on Africa later on. Um, first, I'm, I'm very interested to understand the beginnings because I, I always felt that it's very rare to have, to, to have foreigners involved into real estate. Uh, I feel it's a very local business uh, for every country, it's very local. Uh, for I guess for for every country, it should be local players into, into real estate, into uh, these managing workers, right? One of the workers 
uh, who certainly don't speak a word of English, or may have, you are may, may have been the first foreigners in AC, uh, how, why, how, how did you manage it? And what was the difficulties and how did you, did you, did you find difficulties or it was pretty easy for you? Could you tell us more about that? Um, well, first of all, you do have, I mean, you had a foreigner in the real estate industry in China till, uh, I would say, until uh, 2014. Um, I would say you had princes of real estate, foreign princes. You had guys like Yan Deschamps, you have guys like, they were really famous in, uh, in doing this job. Uh, Mark Suchi, all these kind of great guys that, uh, that just built real estate in Shanghai. Anthony Kors, all these guys that now, Anthony Kors is a managing director of JLL Asia Pacific. I mean, these guys were in real estate. Um, now, when it comes to design and build, and as you mentioned, construction, you indeed have few foreigners, I mean, few Westerners in this field. You have Singaporean, you have Hong Kongese, of course, mainly, but you have few foreigners. Back in, um, I think it was in 2000, back in 2003, uh, I went through a, a course of, in law and safety. It was mandatory for, for people in my position to do it. And I was indeed the only foreigner, only Westerners in this course of 40 people. We had Singaporeans, we had Hong Kongese, they were owner or PM, uh, but I was the only Westerners, like taking your Chinese course on, on the law and safety. Um, you know, as I had a previous background in, in a diverse industry, um, managing workers was not to me was not a, a shock. It was just like a interesting. It was challenging. Um, and one, uh, once again, you know, I had a really good project manager that was with me for many years, uh, and he was doing really the management. I was managing him, and he was managing the rest. Uh, so of course, it's not like you know, it's it's uh, uh, it was great years of. Uh, the biggest challenge for me was to ensure the quality for our client. Let me see. The integrity of our brand and the integrity of the project. Yeah, that's it. I see. So how did you ensure it? Um, by being there every day on site. <laughs> no, what happened is, uh, you know, when you manage workers when you were on site, at the end of the day, you have to be on site. Because for any construction worker, uh, you tell him, oh, you know, we're doing a project for Microsoft. He doesn't know Microsoft, period. Uh, so he, the only way that he understands that this, is, this project is important for the company is if, if, if he or she sees his boss on site. That's it. You know, so it's, you really have to, uh, it's, you have a commitment towards your company, you have a commitment for, towards your clients uh, to be on site and to show the workers, you know what, you have to care about it because I care about it. Um, so we, we know when I uh, recall my days, uh, what well, was my day, uh, normal, typical office days, okay, uh, Arrive in the morning, I have a time, I mean, team meeting with my staff, looking at the project, looking at the critical line, what happened, what might happen, uh, meeting some suppliers, some real estate agent, and during the afternoon, taking my car, traveling around Shanghai, and just like visiting sites. Yeah, you mentioned timing, you mentioned like availability to be available to, to visit sites and to be, to be um, I would say, a bit um, intense uh, in uh, and on. On the, on the work, and I, I feel that's what you want to convey on your website. The contact form is saying that uh, you are available until 6 p.m. and more if needed, and on the weekend if needed. Um, is, it, is it part of what you sell, the, the constant availability and the, the fact that you are, you are I mean, very intense on, on product? Uh, what it, it is, I mean, I don't think, uh, China is so challenging. It's a, it's, a, it's a market that is so challenging. I don't think that you can succeed if you're not available for your client, period. Um, you have to, you know, especially back in the days when, uh, when the real estate was at this peak. I mean, we had no weekends. You know, you have to answer a pitch. You have to answer uh, basically tender on Monday and they give it to you on Friday. So you have to come during the weekend. I mean, in our line of business, I don't think we can consider... A weekend. It's more like based on I mean, project base. That's the way I, I train my team to think about this. You know, it's like a, it's it's a project base. It's not a time base. It's not a job from nine to six. It's we have a mission to complete. We have a project to complete, um, and that's it. You know, so basically, if it, if it requires us to come on Sunday, we will come on Sunday. If it requires us to okay. end at nine. Mm -hmm. It's more the market, which is like this. I'm like this. Okay, yeah. I understand. So to to go to come back on what. DBX is doing. So I want to find an office. I you are not looking for office space, right? I, I have to find real estate agents for the office space. 
once I found a, an office space or different office spaces I like, then I go to you and uh, I ask you if you can design it. And again, what I found out in your, um, in your, in your book on the website, in, in your sales process, is that you are offering a free consultation. So the free consultation consists in, I provide to you uh, the, enough information for you to give us advice um, on how to organize a place or if it's a good place for us or not. And then I can sign the lease because I feel confident that you can do a good work on it and you can rearrange it and with the price you, you would have given to me beforehand. Is it, is it what, what, you, what you do in terms of sales process? And then once we sign with you, you, you take in charge of construction of even the taking sign, I mean, the phone lines and so on. Where, where, where do you stop? I mean, you don't look for the, we, you don't help people finding the office, uh, but, and then you give the key to, to your clients to use the office on their found one, the redesigned one, right? Am I, am, I, am I correct? Or can, can you tell us more about what, what does it take? What, where, where do you stop your services where, until where it goes? Well, basically, um, it's like this, you know, after being in China for 20, 23 years and, uh, and having a company for 14 years, uh, basically, we, where do we start? We start basically when, technically, it's, as you mentioned, is once you have your location, then you call us. But what we could do and what we do often is once you think about moving out, you better call us. Why? Because honestly, you have really, you have, I mean, few business owners as you have, I have, an, I have a clear idea of how much space you really need. Okay, first of all. So basically we help you think about, okay, the space you really need. We help you to think about what is the new workspace strategy that you need to apply, how you need to think your business in the next five years, not what you used to think before. Um, and then again, of course, because we have a really good knowledge of each buildings in China, we tell you, okay, you can go to this one, the rent might be cheaper, but in fact, you might face, you might face a, more expensive price of fitting out or more expensive cost of renovating the air condition, for instance. Um, so that's the thing. So we really come as, as a consultant on this part. We do not want to step on, a, on, a, on the real estate, on the agent footstep, uh, but we come here to tell you, you know what? Uh, we don't really care where you're going. We just tell you, you sh because we've done so many projects in grade A, grade B, grade B minus, uh, and super grade A offices, um, we also know what you, what you are in terms of industry and what maybe you should look at. We also understand what the new employees, what the millennials want, because you know, at the end of the day, we also want design place for them. Um, so we will tell you, okay, basically, um, Matthew, okay, your, your team will need more space, more thing. You know, you might want to come closer to the subway to, you know, forget about grade A, take a grade B, have a better fit out, uh, take this spot, uh, because you, you will have less cost when it comes to renovate or change the air conditioning, blah, blah, blah. So basically, once you sign the lease, we take the key from you. We design, uh, we fill out, and we put everything. We are what we call turnkey, meaning that we, uh, we do uh, all the fire, air conditioning, uh, IT installation, security, uh, furniture, of course, plantation. We also help you for your move. Basically, and when we're done, we give you back the key. It's, it's a bit of a plug and play. Okay, okay, I see. And you know all the regulations for FI, you know all the regulations for you have to, con to, to, to comply to. So basically, it's the only one services. Yeah, I see. I understand. I understand. Yeah. Uh, when you say fit out, by the way, on your website, what do you mean? Fit out firm? Uh, it's a term of interior building. Basically, what we do when we call fit out is uh, we take a bare shell, like a concrete bare shell place, and we uh, we uh, build the interior. We apply the carpet, so, so we build the wall, uh, the ceiling, the lights, everything. That's what we call fill out. I see. I see. Could you give us a, a, a case that uh, a case you are especially, I mean, uh, uh, proud of, or you think would be very interesting for people who listen to us to we could, could help them understand your business and how. How maybe some how the challenges that uh, some uh, some of the clients may have faced and you have solved. Um, so a case study that could be an example to to visualize. 
we have many case studies. Um, the first one would be, uh, for instance, how you work in a, what we call secure environment. Uh, for instance, where we work with the French consulate in Shanghai, and we work with them for six years. It's hard to, uh, hard to create an environment with secure drawings. Um, uh, and, and as you know, of course, consulate have typical, I mean, uh, uh, requirements. Um, so, how, so how we secure the drawings, even for our staff, for our supplier. Uh, that was really interesting. What we work, of course, we work with the French Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we've been uh, the appointed designer uh, since uh, 2006 till now. So we did Bonjour, we did Shanghai many times. Um, but the, take the French Chamber of Commerce. What happened? For instance, um, I don't remember when. Uh, I think it was 2012 um, when the director of the, of the French Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai called me. You know, they had some a water leaking from the neighbor upstairs. Uh, the, basically, the floor, the floor it was 1,400 square meters, were under five centimeters of water. And this is what we do. You know, we, when we are, when you sign with us, basically we are here when, in, when you're in need. Uh, so we came in, we, we sit down with them, we just we'll talk about how we're going to do, how long it will take us, how we can compartment the space so people can still work when we renovate the space. I mean, this is what we do. Okay. I like to say that DBX is a bespoke. Uh, designer and built. Uh, we we were never built to uh, to be like a mother to do a huge project. Uh, but what we do is that bespoke tailor. We design and build spaces that fits you. That is the same. Uh, and in any kind of requirements. Uh, so we, when we build factories, at the same when we uh, you know when you come to see us to build a, I don't know a suit factories, we'll not say oh you know let's see how much money we're gonna make. We're going to sit down and say, okay, let's see what is, what is practical, what we should do, what you shouldn't do. Uh, let's use the best practice. Uh, what is your budget? Let's work around your budget uh, to make sure that you can operate. What is the same? Yeah, I, I saw on the yeah. website that you mentioned your budget. You mentioned your budget is unique, which is a, a surprising, uh, interesting way, uh, I mean, to, to mention that actually you can indeed uh, find uh, something which can fit within the budget of, of your clients. Um, okay, um, I, I understand. Let me come back to this. When I say the budget is unique, and it's true, um, your budget as Dashway Consulting will never be the same as Audemars Piguet, uh, or to be the same as uh, Perma, you know, or the Bank of Rothschild. That's the, that's the same, you know. But our job is to make sure that we cater to your business to give you the best of, of what you can afford. That is the same. You know, and if, if we cannot, sorry, you know, just like, you know, it's, we have a, a limit in terms of, you know, we don't, we don't want you to be sorry for it. You know, it's okay. We want you and your team to be comfortable in, to have a certain well-being and to operate perfectly in your space. And as well, we say that each budget is unique that way. Yeah. Interesting wording. Um, and can you tell us more about your association with your Chinese partner? Uh, we have seen in China a lot of companies failing because of partnership or misunderstanding because of partnership. Actually, especially in real estate, when you look at the hotels which cannot own the, the, the building, but can only manage it, there's always some tensions between the guy who owns the building and the guy who manages the building. Uh, I guess uh, real estate has been an example in China of uh, Fail, say, failing partnerships uh, so far? I mean, it depends which aspect of real estate is a big industry. Could you tell us more about how, how you made it successful? Because it works. Um, you know, it's really interesting because many people, you know, when I meet people, they tell me, oh, you know, when you go into partnership with Chinese, you have to sign this, you have to sign that, you have to make sure, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, start, I started DBX out of a handshake with my business partner. You know, we just shook hands and say, you know, we're going to work for 10 years more. And uh, we're going to create what we become the top one design and build, I mean, French design and build company for corporate real estate. Um, and we, from the beginning, we really split a role. She was in charge of the finance and she was in charge also of making sure that we had the best price for our supplier. And I was in charge of the rest operation, design, construction, quotation, everything. Um, and it made the work so easy, you know. So you know, it's it's it was like, and we had no issue, no no uh, 
ego issue or whatever. You know, it's and because we were working towards the same goal, we work great. It was a great association. But how do you mean? Uh, because we were, to do that on an end chain, yeah. Yeah, basically we met as, as many Chinese companies have built on is we met working together for private <laughs> for private uh, owner. So okay. And when, when you were working together, did, was it was it the person that you had uh, you enjoyed the most working with? Was it the person you trusted most? Was it the person who actually was you felt was the most um, uh, the most ambitious? What 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 made you think it was she was the right partner? I think it's she, right? It's a she. It's a she. What makes me think she was the right partner? Actually, it's it's uh, prior to that nothing, uh, and she was the one convincing me to move out to open DBX. Uh, because you know she she could see how much we were working for private bus, how much like uh, I mean basically I was I was running the company uh, and taking everything, so it, it was. I I understand. So you were running the, you were basically uh, so involved in the company before that you knew everything about this company, you were managing it, and she was seeing you as the one who could bring business, and she doesn't know how to bring business, but she knows how to manage it. So then she thought it was complimentary, and she told you, uh, as a lot of Chinese actually dream of, let's start a business. Um, okay. okay. How, how is it it about structure? That's, that's something which is very often asked. I mean, is it a purely Chinese company? Again, it's real estate, with a lot of Oh, there's actually a lot of workers. How is it organized? A pure Chinese company. Okay, so you trusted her that yeah. uh, she would respect your agreement. Yeah. Okay, okay. For people who are not very, very aware of this, I mean, we may listen to us. You have in China differences between Chinese equity company, foreign equity company, and when both of them are merging, it's called a joint venture. And it's got a lot of paperwork to go through it. And some industries are forbidden, actually, for foreign businesses. Actually, interior design is forbidden, right? You could have, you could have registered a Wufi, right? Uh, no, we could have not. We could have started a Wufi in design only, but not in construction. I see, I see. And you didn't think about and starting two businesses? No, no, like we didn't one, think about it. And yeah. we, uh, no, we didn't think about it. And we get, uh, we, honestly, we get caught into action. I mean, we started really fast. Um, and believe me, you know, when you're busy building your business, uh, you're not really busy, busy building the paperwork. Um, so when it was great, it was it worked perfectly. And you have to keep in mind something, and that's uh, something an advice I give anybody that wants to open uh, to, that want to venture in a in a Chinese only company with a Chinese partner. Um, what you have to make sure you have to make sure that at the end of the month or at the end of two months, you don't leave too much money on the back end cards. Because at the end of the day, temptation ruins your partnership. Uh, that is the thing. But when you have, I mean, nothing to steal from, uh, not that much money on the bank account, that's it. But of course, if you let, like, uh, if you have 10 million running on the bank account, something might happen. Okay. Okay. So, okay, I see. I see. So you are not the owner of the company. A bit like uh, all the people who, who buy, uh, who buy uh, shares of Baidu or New Oriental on the Nasdaq. Actually, they don't own the company in China because education is forbidden for, for education and design is forbidden for foreigners. So they just own a contract, which is called a BIE, and that's similar what you did, but you have some way a balance of power. It's more like checks and balances, and the company cannot be run without you, so there is a deal between you two partners. Did you sleep well in this agreement? Yes, I did. You know, basically, you know, we have to put everything into perspective. Uh, I was the one until now. I was one bringing back, I think in 12 years, I bought maybe 85% of all businesses. So I'm very aware that if something happened, you know, I could, I could leave the company, open an ex-associate company and still make money. So it was not an issue. You no, know, you have to be confident on what you have uh, and to make sure once again that you don't leave that much money on the bank account, on the company bank account, otherwise you might, have, you might end up <laughs> with nightmares. Um, yeah. But once again, the partner was really trustable. It's something like uh, it's, and you have to work your way. Of course, we had we had clashes, uh, we had disagreement, like brothers and sisters, you know, and uh, and that's it. But we built a company together, uh, and we had fun. We had stresses. We had fun. We that's life. You you were talking, speaking uh, each other in English or Chinese, by the way. Chinese. It doesn't. She now English is getting better, but she did not speak English. Chinese. Chinese. Okay, you were not understand mm -hmm. to misunderstand things from her, 
to misunderstand things, to overinterpret your your change was good enough and you could understand fine what you were seeing and not be scared to misunderstand. In some some aspects maybe very technical, right? Like payment terms, like construction, the risk you may take over the construction, uh, insurance and so on, maybe technical. And you were doing all in China and were fine. You have to remember that I moved in China in 94. Uh, at that time, few people, few Chinese spoke English or French, so I had to speak Chinese. I had to learn Chinese. And uh, in my first job, when I was working in the entertainment business, no staff were speaking English. So I had my, my Chinese was, you know, back in the, already in 99, I think I was dreaming in Chinese already. Um, so that's the thing. I was, I've always been working in an entirely, I mean, a purely Chinese environment. The only people I spoke in English were my foreign workers. Okay. You, you, you learn Chinese on your own or you took yeah. classes? You I went for three your... months at the university and then after that oh. I learned on my own. Three months and then after on your own. Okay. You, you're not typing, right? You, you speak and you type. I speak and I type, yeah. Much more difficult to write. Okay. I understand. So I went on your website and looked a little bit at the code and so on to see if you were using some digital tools to get clients and so on. I'm seeing some interesting tools you are using, like Optim Optimizely on your website. You have a Facebook pixel, but I don't see a lot you are doing online. How do you get your clients? I guess it's not online, it's mainly offline, right? Oh, well, you have to see, you know, it's, uh, I must admit that on this, on DBX, we're not big on digital. Why? Because we are really uh, onto the Chinese market. Um, and in our line of business, we get really, uh, it's more like referral. People will give us referral. Uh, like you, if I do your office, Matthew, you're going to introduce me to somebody else. Uh, and, and even if I, we go, we work with real estate agents, we work with lawyers, um, that are things. So to, we could use, uh, of course, like a internet digital tools to drive more clients, to drive more traffic to our site. Um, but then again, you know, doing it abroad would not make sense. We have to do it for China uh, or Baidu and everything. And, uh, and I don't think it will, it will uh, create more traffic because at the end of the day, um, this is really a Chinese way of saying thing. Like, you know, it's like, it's like your, let's say if I, if I call your uh, director of, of human resource and say, okay, we have DBX. Um, if I say that, okay, I've been introduced by, I don't know, Stella, which is your friend. Okay, that's it. You know, I mean, the funny thing is most clients that we had uh, barely watch our, barely go and see our website. Okay. I thought you were using your website as a brochure to, to send to them, this is what we, or case is what we did before, but no, actually it's through email or through paper. Okay, I understand. Thank you. You, you, you mentioned that it's mainly raffle. Um, I, so uh, I think you are a very social person. Uh, you are, uh, you are talking with people, making people like so on. Did you learn that somewhere or did you just by practicing? And because your business needed it to be, or it's your character. I think it's my character. Because some people have really learned about it, you know, uh, learning about negotiation, learning how to behave with people, reading a lot of books, actually written mainly by American authors about how to behave and so on. And they have uh, patterns, they find patterns. Have you found some patterns on how to convert a referral you get? Do you have a, a sales process you are following? or it's more intuition and feeling during the meeting? Uh, I would not say intuition. It's just like, you know, what we it's, it's uh, error and trial. It's what I've worked uh, and that we apply. Uh, of course, so of course we have behavior, you know, I want myself to, to, to have some class on behavior analytics, how to analyze, analyze behavior. Um, but that being said, you know, I always tell my, my team, uh, okay, this is what I've done. It hasn't worked, but maybe it will work on me. Uh, maybe that nothing is carved in stone. Uh, that's the thing. So you know, they are free to try something else. Um, but of course, you know, when you look at how we approach clients, it's, really, it's rather systematic. You know, how we do, how, the way we approach, the way we present things, uh, when we do presentation, you know, the, the, the order of the slide where we want to show it's, it's based on, on, a, on a human behavior. So you say it's not systematic. You have not systematized too much your business. It's more, it's purely even the, the approach to client is bespoke. You are going to prepare for a specific client, specific presentation. That's what you are telling me, right? Yeah. Yeah, because you see, each client is different. Um, 
we work with great names, as I say, you know, if you work with Odemar Spiegel, uh, basically he doesn't care that you've done a bank of for he doesn't care that you've done a, a, the greatest, the biggest like VC firm uh, in China. What he wants, he wants to know if you've done some luxury brand before, period. And uh, so that's so we have to work on a different approach. We, uh, we have to show him different things. Uh, but basically, it's almost the same thing. Is what is systematic is what how, what we show to the client. It's the approach. Okay, we meet a client. What we're going to show it. Uh, it's really like it's going to be based on his requirements, on his DNA, on his industry DNA, or even on where he or she comes from. Um, because once again, if I uh, if I meet uh, an American and tell him, oh, we've done the French consulate. Okay, good. So what? But if I tell him, oh, you know, we've done we've done uh, Prologis, which is the uh, biggest real estate. Uh, industrial real estate in the U.S. We say, "Oh, great!" You know, I have this. I have this example. Um, once I was at the gym, and I was talking to a guy coming from Singapore, and um, he asked me, "I say, what do you do?" I say, "Oh, you know, I work for a design and build firm." So, oh, which one? I say, "Oh, DBX." Oh, I don't know. And um, and I told him, "Okay, uh, we've work. Uh, we've done uh, Air France. We've done uh, uh, GC Deco. Blah blah blah." And the guy did a bunch. And I was like, "Wow!" And I've I try to recall which Singaporean company we've done. I say, oh, we've done PSA. PSA is Singapore Port Authority. It's yeah, huge. And then to get look at me, say, wow, you must be so good. <laughs> it was fun because you know it was like to me it was a small 300 square meter project. It was like, and uh, but for the Singaporean guy, it was like a name. And we've done many Singaporean companies like a huge name like Excel Point, uh, NCS, whatever. Uh, but if you tell it to a French guy or French lady. She you won't, you won't ring a bell, but to a Singaporean, it was like, wow, you must be so good. That is. Sure. So it's cultural understanding. It's cultural understanding. It's contextualization. You contextualize the speech for each client. I see. But is it your team can do it, or you are the one who do it? No, they can do it. Okay. You know, it's, a, it's an approach that, you, that you know, I've learned this approach even in China. Uh, as I say, I told you, you know, when you, when you do a project for Microsoft or Apple and you so, so the worker doesn't care who it is. Uh, so you have to make, build into the, basically, uh, to make him understand, or make her understand, you know, in, into our own uh, concept. Like it's, 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 and once you apply it, you, I think you need to apply it in many aspects when you meet people, to make people understand. Um, and uh, so once you teach your team to do it, they can do it perfectly. You know, it's, 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 I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's normal. Okay, okay. Because I see a lot of businesses which you are relying a lot on the funders, uh, the fund of the funders. And I feel that dealing with your clients is a lot about memory about the past products. So I was thinking that the best person who could talk about the past product is yourself. So that was my question. But have you found a way that your team is able to talk about all the products you did before, or you still have to supervise and mention the several good product you have to? To you work before, and you know, I work still hands on basically. Uh, I have to be hands on when it comes to concept uh, or managing big project or managing complex project, uh, because you see, uh, a, a profession gets better with age. You know, an architect, an interior designer, construction, we get better with age uh, because we've seen so many things. Uh, so we can basically say, you know what, no, don't do this because. It's, you have an impact on this one. You know, we can, when we, when I see a layout, I can tell you, okay, well, you shouldn't do it because it doesn't make sense. You know, because I can, I can project your company in five years time. The same. So, and it takes experience to do so. Not because I'm the greatest like architect, I'm the greatest, I'm the smartest man on earth. It's just because I've done so many projects before. So I can tell you that okay, now in the next five years, you will still not work like this, or even yeah. in the next two years. That's right. Uh, that's why the value of the company is yourself. I mean, yeah, it, it's sometimes difficult to disconnect the value of your company and the value of yourself. And that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs want to, is to disconnect the value of themselves to the value of the company so they can go on holiday sometimes, right? So is it still the case? Yeah. Yes, it is. But I see that you have to make some compromise. Uh, you know, as I told you, uh, I ventured into Africa in, uh, in 2010. And uh, starting that time, I started to travel more and more. And, and true, my business took a hit in China because I was no, no longer more involved. But you see, I believe in putting my team into the, into the dirt in a way like, you know what? You know, you have to be, you have to be able to handle this thing. You know, I'm going to give you everything that I know. I'm going to try to tell you everything that I know. 
um, and, and don't do it, you know, and you have to, you know, in China, it's a lot of learning by doing, you know, and of course they've done mistakes, I mean, they've done great things, I'm sure that they have great, greater achievement than they've done, in a way, um, and they will learn their own way, you know? but true, it's, it's uh, once again, you know, when it comes to complex or high profile clients, uh, I have to be hands on. Okay. When you reached about six million dollars of turnover, how many projects was it in a year? I'm sorry. Come again. How many projects was it in this year when you reached six million dollars? Roughly. Or what's the average size? Well, the average size is it's. Uh, you know, we used to do like twenty thousand square meter a year, design and build. Uh, so the average size maybe one thousand five. You know, so we're talking about what 10, 10 like 15 projects. So when you say the turnover, when you talk about the turnover, you include all the cost of construction, all the, the, the purchases you have to do for electricity and so on. This is within your turnover, right? I know. When I'm talking about your turnover, it's how much money we how much money we generate. Turnover, six million. Mm -hmm. And inside inside this turnover, you have to pay for the workers, for the construction. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the material to, to build the, the new office, right? So you have, you have, it's pretty heavy in terms of cost, isn't it? Uh, yes, of course, we are, we are looking at the cost of, like, that goes, they can grow up to 80%. Of it. So basically, you know, many, you know, 80% of, of, of your revenue. Okay. Of your okay, I see, I see, I see. Okay, it's a bit like advertising when we interview, when we talk with people in advertising, that they tell us the budget, but they have to give like half of it to Weibo and the third to WeChat and then they get the, basically the, the, the fees on it. But okay, I understand. I understand. So you just talked about Africa and it seems that's a topic you want to talk about um, since the beginning and I, I, I try to focus on China first. By the way, how is it about being a foreigner in China, living in China as a foreigner? How, did, did you feel it helped you to do business? Did you feel it? It uh, slow you to 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 new, new growth. What's your feeling? I feel like uh, you know I lived in Beijing for a year. Uh, I think there's a different city to live in. I loved living in Shanghai. You know, the great. It's you know, now I moved to Singapore. Of course, and I moved between Singapore and China. Um, uh, it was a great time. Shanghai is a great city for foreigners. Um, it's challenging, um, but when when it, when it comes to business, I will always say that China is a, it's a game with two rules. You have one set of rules for Chinese and one set of rules for foreigners. Yeah, it's my feeling as well. The rules are not the same, but you have to know the rules. And sometimes it can be positive, sometimes it can be negative. Uh, and um, I, yeah, I use, I use the word like um, uh, Chinese uh, tend not to be xenophobic or xenophilic, but xenoreactive. I mean, they, they react <laughs> to, to people, right? But differently. Yeah. You, you will never be Chinese, I will never be Chinese, and I will be treated differently, but it doesn't mean bad or, or good. Uh, which is something different in France, I think, because uh, in other countries, sometimes being a foreigner is perceived as negative, um, and uh, there's no really yeah upside of being a foreigner. Uh, but here in China, there is an upside and downside. And okay, so coming back to Africa, you said that from 2010 you began to investigate into Africa, and I like after we before we finish because we still have like 15 minutes. Uh, we talk about your your interest in IT and how it influenced uh, the way you managed DBX. I think it would be a very interesting uh, topic to, to, to look at on how you go on, you, you investigate another domain, another field, and which can influence your main business. But let's go back on this later on. Just talk, I don't want to forget it, that's why I, I'm telling it uh, to you now. So about Africa, so what did you do that? Uh, basically, I'm from Togo, okay? Um, and uh, as I was like, as the company was running, and I was pretty pleased with what we've done, uh, I said, you know what? At the end of the day, let's let's try to to go back and see uh, what I, what I can what I've, if what I've learned could could benefit Africa in any way. So uh, I traveled to Liberia, I traveled to Gabon. I mean, I traveled to sixteen African countries till now, um, and it was great. I mean, it's uh, the beauty of of Africa in a way. It's uh, it's like China. At different years. You say one article is China in the 1990s. Yeah, correct. Uh, yeah, because when you go to, uh, let's say you go to uh, to Accra in Ghana, you will see like, wow, it's like Shanghai in uh, 2005. 
You go to Nairobi in Kenya, you will say, oh, it's like Shanghai in 2010. You go to Johannesburg, it's like, okay, it's like Shanghai uh, two years ago. Uh, you go to Liberia, it's like, wow, it's like Moravia, it's like Shanghai in, in the 80s. <laughs> so it's different. I mean, it's in terms of real estate, in terms of potential, in terms of, uh, of youth, uh, it's incredible. That being said, I, I think there will be, there will, no, there will not be uh, any other market like China in terms of, of size, dimension, unity. Um, it's, it's unique. Um, but Africa definitely has huge opportunities, huge opportunities with real estate in design and build for, uh, field. Uh, it's difficult. Uh, Africa is another beast. Uh, then it's, but it's, it's great. Yeah, let's get a little bit, well, I, I try to understand the motivation as well behind it. You say you are from Togo, but you're French, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. I'm both. Yeah, so, so I, I feel there's a lot of people who actually have an international background and they are some way attracted to go back to their roots. Uh, was it uh, because of China, which was reflecting to you uh, those roots, or it was something you had always in, into you to go, to do something for Africa, to do something in Africa? Because you said something which is interesting. You said, I want to do something for Africa. You didn't say, I want to do something in Africa. So that means I think that the, the motivation behind it seems to be beyond business. Uh, is it something that uh, after your successful uh, um, journey in China, you wanted to do something else in Africa? Could you explain us more about the motivation? Yes, it is. But you see, uh, when I moved to China in 94, I remember that I wrote a letter to my mom and I said, you know what? Uh, Africans have to learn from China. In 94. Uh, you know, it's like we have to stop looking at Europe as a role model and we have to learn from China. So to me, after many years in China, I say, you know what, you know, I've learned things, I've learned great things in China and I think I could apply it in, in Africa in many ways. And, uh, and it's, it's true and it's, it's, uh, I'm convinced that the future of Africa will lay in its relationship with Asia. Why, why do you think it's, it's, it, the development of Africa will be linked more to Asia than the West? Uh, because the West sees Africa for its past, when uh, Asia sees Africa for its futures. So it is different. Um, you know, you go to France, you talk to uh, whoever guys um, or ladies that work for in a, in, a, in a Fortune 100, they tend to see Africa like, oh, you know, uh, as it used to be. Uh, when we speak to a Chinese, you would see, okay, you see Africa as it's, it's, it should become. Okay, so what, let's get specific on what you did in Africa. Uh, did you, did you, what, what did, what did you do? Did you, did you realize some development about that? Did you develop and? Um... Yeah. So what we did basically, we worked with different departments, with private uh, investors as well as government people, to work on uh, uh, reinstatement of, of distressed assets, like distressed building, um, in Liberia, for instance. So it was really interesting how we work, how to we redesign, how we work on even on small city planning. Uh, we work in, uh, on, uh, on uh, social housing in Gabon. We work on university, how to renovate a university in Gabon as well. Uh, we work with private investors in Cameroon, uh, in Uganda. Uh, so it's really interesting. It's, 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 uh, you know, when you come from a Chinese background, uh, and we, when you have the speed with you, ideas, and when, you, when you've done this job so many times, so you come with fresh ideas and fresh way of doing stuff. Um, so what, what people might say, oh, this is impossible. Say, of course it's possible. You just have to twist it a bit, do this, do that, and stop looking for perfection. It does not exist. Looking for pragmatic, be pragmatic. That is it. And do you feel you can leverage, uh, I understand you can leverage your experience you have on 20 years, uh, on 15 years uh, in, a, in a design build, but do you feel that you can leverage also the relationship with China, like um, sourcing, sourcing material or sourcing products, or it's more the experience? Oh, it's it's uh, it's everything. It's the experience, the knowledge, the relationship that I have in China, uh, and it's not it's not what I believe is what I've done. I will really leverage my knowledge and my experience and my my, my relationship to to uh, export things uh, that matters to like electronic goods. Um, and hopefully next year we'll do uh, we'll, we'll work more on uh, on uh, big projects. 
how do you how do you find a product in Africa? Because you don't have an office, right? We opened a company in Gabon, which we didn't know. We didn't have this. We didn't. We had to shut it down because the cost of running was too expensive, uh, and it was not a big market. So basically, what how we found product is just by the network of relationships that I created over there, by friends that reference us. Uh, and you know, at the end of the day, you don't have that many uh, black dudes that that have success in China that come to come back to Africa. So it's, it's uh, yeah, yeah, you're unique, and you. Uh, people might talk about you, may, you may meet, people remember of you easily because of your, your story. Especially when you come with, uh, with the will of on doing something. You know, many, uh, we have many people from the diaspora that come back uh, to Africa and uh, coming from Europe and see things once again as a past. Uh, but, you know, you, coming from China, you know, even if I bring you to Africa, you will come, you know, we want to disrupt things. Because every day we are facing disruption in China. So when you come, you have you come with new ideas. So uh, you don't have that many people. I would say you don't have that many Afro Asian, as I call myself, and the bunch of uh, of, of uh, Africans that have been, I would say, raised in China, that come to that come back to Africa with a with a will and uh, the will and the ability to change things, to do things. Uh, I will not I will I will not be so pretentious to say that we're going to change things, uh, but definitely we're going to work together to build new things. Talking about the diaspora, China has relied on the diaspora to some way uh, develop part of the economy. But I always feel that there is a part of the diaspora which is uh, Chinese diaspora, which is totally disconnected now to the Chinese economy and they don't understand China anymore when they come back, especially after one or two generations. And there is a diaspora of Chinese who went abroad to study only and then came back to the country like 10, 15 years ago. Um, what do you feel about Africa? Do you feel do you feel the same segmentation can make sense? Um, because um, the, the, the situation is different, the diaspora can play a different role in, in Africa. Uh, I think the situation is uh, could be the same. Uh, I believe that you, you have the elder generation, uh, like people like my dad, uh, that moves that, that move to, to France to, uh, to study, do, did their own career, and eventually, at the end of the day, it went back to Africa. Um, but they didn't really work on doing something. But now you have, I would say, my generation uh, that wants to do something. So they go, they go to France, they study, and boom, they, want, they really want to do something. Um, and you have also a different, of, I would say, of generation. You know, I always say, like, especially in, so once again, you have to understand there's, there is different Africa. There is a Francophone Africa, there's a French-speaking Africa, and there is an English-speaking Africa, which is totally different in terms for business. In the Francophone Africa, people that are what, 50, 60, the only dream that they had is they wanted to become minister. Okay. People that are in the 30s, like you, 40s, like me, we want to be, to be businessmen. We want to make business. And the difference lay there. So we really want to do something when before the scene is, okay, I want to become a technocrat. I want to become a minister. So the interest was different. Yes, I see. So you see the, the, the segmentation more in terms of age than in terms of what people did before, okay, I see. Exactly, more in terms of age. And when you move to English, to English speaking Africa, I mean, most of the diaspora, which is young, I mean, they are businessmen. You know, they've seen the opportunities, they see, okay, what happened, you know, it's, they're looking at fields that their parents would never look at, like agriculture, like their parents would never look at agriculture. But, you know, I met a guy from I was Zambia, and uh, he had a business in the passion fruit, and he was doing great. So you see all these kind of things. Uh, and he was, he was raised in London, but that didn't stop him from doing agricultural business in, in Zambia. So. Yeah, I see, I see. So before we close, um, you went into uh, tech in Africa, and um, I, I, we, we, we talked a lot about it. We, we would work together a little bit on part of, of your journey. Uh, and could you tell us more about uh, uh, about what you did and how it influenced your main business because I still feel your main business is still GDBX and how yeah. this, um, this uh, deep dive into tech, mobile, um, the internet basically, uh, changed your perception on, on GDBX. Um, you know what I did in, a, in a, actually I moved into tech in Africa as a good Chinese. Uh, I saw an opportunity and I just moved into it. 
um, in this way, you know, you, you know, something that you cannot undo on me. It's, I think it as, as a Chinese businessman. That's it. You know, I've been, uh, uh, you know, my uh, my business acumen has been sharpened in China. You know, so I really think as a Chinese businessman. So I was I was working on a on a design and build project for the Ministry of Education in Gabon. I saw the huge lack in education in tools to educate uh, young Africans and the, the huge needs for it. I also saw the lack of data when we talk about data, and data is a new oil um, that we have. I mean, we don't know anything about these students, but my God, there are 200 million of them. Just said, and they will become the next uh, the next uh, middle class. Um, so I started the social media that were part of 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 uh, I would say like giving them knowledge that they don't have, and also giving them the ability to connect together, and uh, for us giving us a way to to acquire data. And it was great because it, it, uh, it put me in, in front of the reality of the internet in emerging markets. Um, it's not what we believe. It's just like, you know, when you take, let's say Cameroon, that only has 20% internet penetration. Uh, well, you don't, you don't uh, put ads on uh, Facebook and hoping it will succeed. It doesn't work like this, you know? So it's, it's, uh, it really allowed me to, to see a different approach uh, and to create offline communities, which is really interesting. And we know the way we enroll people, we, we enroll them by making them filling forms. Like, you know, it's like, what? But yes, it works crazy, just like, you know what? Because they were so used of filling forms. So, you know, it's just, we enrolled thousands of them, just filling forms, giving them giving us, uh, information on, on their phone numbers and name, what they like and things like this. So it was great. Um, what it gave me for DBX, it uh, allowed me to move into the tech world, which I was, I, I, I'm a techie, but I was not into it. Um, and it allowed me actually to push the momentum and to create, to, I mean, you will see next year, we're working on a new project. It will still be in Africa. It will, it will be heavily on design and build, uh, but it will incorporate tech as well. So it's going to be fun. Okay, so you leverage it. Okay, I, I feel that moving from one industry to another, I mean, basically, you have invest, you have uh, worked in two different industries. One which is construction, I mean, design build, and then after what, social media, building a social media. It's totally different. And in some way, you don't really leverage uh, your, your, your past experience. Do you feel it's, um, it's, uh, it's good because you open your eyes or it's a mistake that's slowing you down? What's your, what's your take on it if you, if you have to advise uh, other entrepreneurs who maybe feel a bit bored with their business and want to get a new momentum with another very, very sexy and very trendy industry. In a way, if you look at numbers, it was a mistake because it did slow DBX down. Uh, uh -huh. Because I did really focus for one year, like, you know, I was like, a, I was managing team in India, managing team in Cameroon, uh, managing my, overseeing my Chinese team uh, in DBX. Uh, it was like a bit of split. Um, and yes, we took a hit. We took a hit on the numbers. Uh, that being said, you know, in, uh, in two years from now, I think it will, it, it was a, it will have been a smart idea for me to have moved into this, this, this tech world. Because now, you know, we, uh -huh. uh, last year we also, uh, two of my staff, two of my teammates uh, in DBX started a pro, uh, prop tech project, you know, which I was overseeing. Um, and we could never have started it if I had, if I didn't have this, this uh, knowledge of internet that they acquired. Um, and now we can, you know, it's, uh, now I can talk about tech, I can talk about blockchain, I can talk about things because you know, I know how it works and I know I can, how it can work in emerging markets. I understand. Okay, okay. Coming to an end, uh, I think it's one hour already actually. Uh, how did you like it? How did you like the interview? How did you, um, did you think you missed some part of the, of the journey? What, what, what's your... What's your feedback? No, you didn't anything. You know, it's really hard to come back to uh, to ask someone with, about these 20, 24 years, 23 years in uh, of life, of professional experience, and, and even for DBX, which is like since 2004. I mean, it's really hard. But you did ask good questions. Um, that's the only thing for anybody that wants to open business in China. I would say it's, it's great. It's uh, it's never too late. You just have to uh, you just have to think it. You no, know, you have to understand that you you will take some heat. You never it will not be easy. Uh, but it's feasible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time, and I really enjoy talking to you as always. And um, I'm looking forward to for you to send you the, the podcast and the vlog will be online, I guess, in, uh, in two weeks.
Thanks, Jake. Bye, everyone.